Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Selena. We're engineers on the observability team at Uber, where we work on M3DB, our open source time series database. And today, we're here to share our story with you of putting M3DB on Kubernetes. Before we jump into that, though, we want to give you some context on what M3DB is. M3DB is part of M3, which is Uber's open source metric stack. M3 has been in production at Uber since 2016, and we've built it in the open since day one. M3DB is the distributed time series database that, sit at the, that sits at the core of M3, alongside our other components, like our fault-tolerant aggregation tier and distributed query engine. To give you a sense of M3DB's usage at Uber, M3DB writes 31 million metrics at 50 gigabits per second across all of our data centers. Uber has over 1,000 instances running M3DB placed in various clusters, and in total, we store almost 9 billion unique metric IDs. When we first built M3DB back in 2016, Operating it was pretty simple. We ran M3DB in two data centers and had one cluster per data center. Our primary use case at the time was real-time alerting and dashboard introspection, so our cluster shared a static configuration. Fast forward to 2018, however, and things aren't so simple. For one, we run M3DB in more data centers, and there are more clusters per data center. The clusters themselves are larger, and they no longer share one configuration. Some store high-resolution metrics for a few hours. Some store low-resolution metrics for up to five years. On top of all of this, we also run M3DB in multiple cloud providers where Uber has a presence. So putting this all together, we now manage over 40 M3DB clusters across a variety of environments. And while M3DB itself is easy to manage, the number of clusters that we operate posed a challenge. And while the number of clusters has grown 20 times, the number of engineers on our team has stayed relatively the same. Here are some features that make M3DB interesting to work with. M3DB stores real-time metrics from all of our services and hosts. So upon receiving a metric, M3DB shards the data into its respective partitions. Each shard is replicated by a factor of three, which are then placed in separate failure domains. The replicated environments are always synced, so when M3DB nodes are added, removed, or replaced, the replication factor and isolation group is honored when redistributing the shards to instances. In terms of maintaining M3DB, the main pain points of it can be broken down into two cycles. The first part is the daily reactive cycle. When a node becomes problematic, an engineer gets paged. Then they would manually SSH into Uber's host to reboot, provision another resource, or decommission the resource. So because of these daily happenings, continuous multi-region environment management is a must. For example, we manage all of our clusters by looking at all of the ones that triggered alerts and also all of the ones that were underutilized, and thus do some capacity planning to effectively manage our load. After these meetings, engineers would have to manually provision and decommission hosts, and we expect this operational toil to increase proportionally with the number of clusters as we continue to rapidly grow. Although we had made these operations easier over the years, we were still faced with a scaling challenge in terms of the sheer number of clusters that we operated. So we set out to find a solution to make managing all of this newfound complexity easier. Our first step was to survey the list of existing tools for managing applications in a cloud-native world. Although we were really excited by the rise of technologies such as Kubernetes, we wanted to make sure that we thoroughly understood our problem space before jumping to a solution. So we broke down what we were looking for in a solution into a few core requirements. Our first requirement was that whatever we chose would have to have primitives to support demanding stateful workloads. Given M3DB's characteristics, we require access to low latency storage. And given our, or given our users' requirements, we require access to the storage across all of our data. We have internal workloads at Uber that randomly query large time windows repeatedly, with look-back periods ranging from a few minutes to a few years and everywhere in between. To give you a sense of what we are looking for, let's take a look at some ways of managing state and containerized applications. One option for managing our state would be to just not manage it at all. An M3DB instance's data would live as long as its container. This might technically be fast, as we would have direct access to the host disk, but it would otherwise be pretty terrible. For one, there's no durability of the data. 
This means that when M3DB containers die or are restarted, they would have to stream terabytes of data from their peers, and this would be wildly inefficient. On top of all of this, when M3DB instances are streaming data, they're not available for reads, which would have dangerous reliability implications. So what if we didn't cho choose to store our state in a more durable manner, using something like a remote block store? This is a pretty popular option, but unfortunately, the latency guarantees provided by a remote block store didn't really match what we were looking for. M3DB stores all of the monitoring data for Uber's global real-time marketplace, and our customers expect to be alerted as soon as there's an issue. For us, that means that every bit of latency in ingesting and serving metrics counts. And while the increased durability is nice, it seemed inefficient to pay someone else to replicate our data slower when we already replicate things three times at the application layer. On top of all of that, a remote block store has different characteristics across different cloud providers and would be potentially out of the question in our internal data centers. Another option we had seen for storing remote state would be to use some, would be to deduplicate de the data and store it on a remote object store, like your friendly neighborhood cloud provider's object store, such as S3 or Google Cloud Storage. While this is a little bit more efficient, as we're only paying to store one copy of the data, we still weren't comfortable with the latency that it introduced for real-time alerting. And additionally, we would still have the problem where we'd have to stream terabytes of data as containers moved around. So all of this left us looking for a solution for storing our state that would be performant, durable, and efficient. Our second requirement was to have our solution work seamlessly in our internal data centers and in the cloud. In the short term, for better or for worse, our current production workloads already run in multi-cloud environments and in our internal data centers. And realistically, we can't just ignore one or the other if we want all of the metrics for an accurate observability picture. In the long term, developing an environment agnostic solution better prepares us for the future. It allows us to dive deeper on core features that would otherwise be considered technical debt down the road. Finally, we really wanted to embrace the global engineering community. We've had a great time spending our efforts open sourcing M3DB, so we thought it'd be pretty silly to make an add-on that the community couldn't take advantage of. We also figured other smart engineers around the world find themselves with similar challenges, and so we figured there must be innovative ideas out there to leverage. Meanwhile, the reality of the situation was, around the time we were thinking of simplifying M3DB management, we had both just come back from KubeCon and seen how others had leveraged Kubernetes for their workloads. So in particular, operators caught our attention. An operator is a set of application-specific custom controllers or custom resource definitions with direct access to the Kube API. It simplifies the lifecycle of Kube native applications from packaging, deploying, and managing and scaling. Engineers can customize rules for the operator to observe, analyze, and act on the deployment to reconcile state. And here's where we notice similarities in the, in the pattern with our M3DB lifecycle. To explain more on reconciling state, operators have direct access to the Kube API and also whatever APIs you choose. So because it's a custom resource definition, it extends the capabilities of Kubernetes as an endpoint in whatever context you're working with. In our case, a potential operator would be able to listen and observe on the happenings of M3DB and its relationship to Kubernetes, and makes adjustments wherever necessary according to the declared desired state. So given our culmination of requirements, combined with our brewing interest in operators, we decided to try a proof of concept on Kubernetes. The big thing for us was that it abstracted away machine failures in management, which was currently the biggest human operation for M3DB. Our code base is strong and packed with fault-tolerant features, but there's only so much it can do within its reach, and Kubernetes would really widen the scope of automated management lifecycle. While we were designing our operator, a few Kubernetes features gave us increased confidence in our decision and were critical to its ability to meet our workload. The first was Kubernetes' support for persistent local volumes. In addition to meeting our performance needs, Persistent local volumes were the storage abstraction that would work across our internal data centers and our cloud environments, where we aren't comfortable using network storage for our workloads. Thinking back to the stateful properties we were looking for, persistent local volumes really met all of our needs. The scheduler is aware of the requirements of local volumes, so Kubernetes keeps our containers on the same node if it can. For durability purposes, the scheduler's understanding of data gravity was super important to us. Local volumes meant that we could still have access to fast local disks and that there wasn't unnecessary duplication of our already replicated data. A 
Additionally, Kubernetes' support for node affinity and the safety guarantees provided by stateful sets were really helpful. Stateful sets enabled us to have strict ordering or strict guarantees around the ordering of pod operations, enabling safe deployments and cluster upgrades. Their use of stable pod identity and sticky storage made managing our cluster topology easier, as we could be sure that instances could easily rejoin the cluster after failures and restarts if they had the same pod identity and storage attached. Node Affinity was a great tool for us to provide a similar abstraction for expressing our requirements for failure domains across our data centers and our cloud environments. By leveraging node affinity and stateful sets, we could pin groups of M3DB instances to zones in the cloud, providing highly available fault-tolerant clusters. This matched what we were used to in our internal data centers, where we made that sure that M3DB instances were evenly dispersed across racks. So with this deeper understanding of our requirements and the confidence that Kubernetes would be able to support our workloads without making performance or safety requirements, we set out building and deploying our proof of concept operator. And we're really excited to share the results of that experience with you. Putting all of this together, we leverage these features to build and deploy our very own M3DB operator. You can check it out right now on GitHub. This operator currently handles a subset of Uber's production M3DB workloads on GCP on GKE. From a Kubernetes perspective, we started with our clusters running in the cloud to lower the barrier to entry for Kubernetes. However, from an M3DB perspective, it is trickier for us to manage clusters in the cloud because we don't have all the original tooling that we originally started with in our own data centers. So how did our engineering efforts ultimately help our team? Now when a node is on fire, our operator is notified instead of an engineer on pager duty. The operator communicates with Kubernetes as to which action it should take in order for the node to become healthy again. In terms of managing our multi-region environment, our plans are now themed at a higher level. Instead of having people resize clusters for the week, we can have one engineer simply make a configuration change to adjust for the appropriate amount of resources. We are actively continuing to lessen the need for capacity planning meetings as well. Ultimately, this means that on-call rotations are healthier, engineers are happier, and the scope of our daily work is less stressful. Our most common human operation is replacing a node instance of M3DB. Let's see what that looks like with our operator. So the first difference that we noticed in our operations is that whereas we previously uniquely identified M3DB instances by host name, now we also have to take into account the storage attached, while the pod names stay the same when working with stateful sets. So when a pod and its corresponding storage fails, our operator is notified and tells Kubernetes. Next, Kubernetes takes care of scheduling a new pod for us with new storage attached if necessary. Our operator uses our regular tooling to publish a new desired state into the cluster topology. In this case, we would like the pod with the same name but new storage attached to replace the pod that had failed. Next, the M3DB instances begin streaming data to, the new, to its new peer. Once the cluster is healthy again, the M3DB instances update the current state in the topology to indicate that the replace has finished. Putting M3DB on Kubernetes taught us some really interesting lessons. The first, it was that it showed us assumptions we had made in building M3DB for a human-operated world that didn't hold true on Kubernetes, and we were able to make our software more robust because of it. We were coming from a world where one host ran one instance of M3DB, meaning that an M3DB instance's identity and storage was equivalent to the host name that it ran on. This isn't the case in Kubernetes, where the pod names may stay the same, but the underlying storage can change. Because Kubernetes revealed this assumption to us, we were able to make M3DB more robust by enabling an instance's identity to take into account more factors than just hostname. As another example, we discovered a race condition in adding hosts to clusters that we had never encountered before because a human simply couldn't do the steps as fast as Kubernetes could. In terms of the big picture, we were able to encapsulate our domain-specific knowledge pertaining to databases and metrics in our code. Users could utilize our experience just by running the operator with a single command, as opposed to reading about all the internals of M3DB. Over the course of building our operator, we think that some of the lessons we've learned might be helpful to you if you're considering Kubernetes for your database or otherwise stateful workload. Our first piece of advice is to make sure that your workload is reliable to operate outside of Kubernetes before thinking about putting it on Kubernetes. 
We had worked really hard over the years to invest in tooling to make M3DB easier and more reliable to operate. And we only considered automating the entire end-to-end -end life cycle when we reached a scaling challenge. At the end of the day, by using Kubernetes, you are introducing complexity into your stack. So reliability before that is pretty important. Our second piece of advice is to attempt to model your stateful workload declaratively. This is a concept that's really core to Kubernetes, and we found that it works great for stateful workloads as well. We were already doing this in, with M3DB, where in our cluster topologies were modeled as desired states stored in etcd that the M3DB instances would work to converge on. This in turn made building our operator easier, as our operator simply had to exchange a series of desired states between M3DB and Kubernetes and wait for those states to converge. Additionally, by storing our topology external to Kubernetes, we avoided a hard dependency on the Kubernetes API in order to operate our clusters. This meant that in disaster scenarios, even if the Kubernetes API was fully down, we could still make cluster topology changes so long as the instances themselves were up. In terms of project planning, it's important to iterate on each step of the stateful interaction. Don't try to mentally solve everything at once and be mindful about what you want Kubernetes to handle. We were, more, we were more focused on reactive stuff to start with, and ultimately those efforts led us to solve proactive hurdles as well. It's okay for some things to still be left to humans. Kubernetes does great in helping bridge gaps along the way. For example, in our use case, our focus for the operator was on handling day-to-day -day operations. We would definitely still need human intervention in some edge case scenarios, such as recovery if we somehow lost an entire region. So what are our next steps? Our operator runs smoothly in the cloud. We're scoping out the work as to how we'd run Kubernetes in our internal data centers. We'd also like to explore auto-scaling of clusters. This goes hand in hand with capacity planning meetings. Currently, it's pretty easy to scale up, but doing so automatically would be another milestone. Also, we don't yet have a solution for managing multiple M3DB clusters that span multiple Kubernetes clusters. So because of this, we don't have a multi-region solution yet. This isn't necessarily a blocker, but it just means that data is stuck in one Kubernetes cluster and a human has to initiate moving it to another cluster. So it's definitely something that needs to be explored with deeper planning. Our experience putting M3DB on Kubernetes has been really positive so far, and we're excited to continue our Kubernetes journey. We're looking at incorporating other parts of the M3 stack into our operator, such as our aggregation tier and our query engine. But we started with M3DB as it's the trickiest to manage. Kubernetes has enabled us to take on new use cases in, in non-standard environments that we otherwise would have had to say no to. For example, we now have production use cases at Uber, where we're shipping subsets of hardware-level data center metrics to M3DB clusters running on Kubernetes in the cloud. This provides us external observability into our infrastructure in the event of data center level failures. This would previously have been too difficult to stand up in the cloud without Kubernetes. Finally, none of this work would have been possible without the hard work of the people that we're lucky enough to call our coworkers who aren't on this stage today. And to all of you who have made Kubernetes into the amazing community and technology that it is today. We'd like to give a special shout out to our colleague Paul Schuess who spearheaded the effort to envision M3 for a Kubernetes world. We'd love to talk more about M3 and Kubernetes with you. Feel free to find us online here. We'll also be around the conference, and if you have trouble finding us, we'll try to, stay at the, we'll try to be at the Uber booth in between all the great talks we're excited to see today. Thank you so much. Thank you.